bring what's in the dark into the light and make global conversations like this 10,000 voices where everyone's invited to the table and it's not just these private think tanks that's one of my big things that I'm talking about in my book is public think tanks and how we're all a part of the conversation we're all a piece of the puzzle so we can all see the big picture definitely think it's a really really great concept it's always good to see that people are willing to you know be the change that is always so often talked about so very excited and happy to be a part of it if I say this shit out loud they might get mad I might not make it out of here but guess what he told me to keep it a billion or I'm gonna keep it a trillion free speech is free speech if you're gonna have it let's have it if we're not, let's censor. Let's censor it. And then let's all put on the same clothing and let's all eat the same slop and let's all believe the same, have the same beliefs. Oh yeah, they have a name for that. It's called communism. Oh man, I shouldn't have said that. Oh well, it's too late. I do this project where I put up blank canvases and communities um, and then just leave paints and brushes for people to paint on the canvases and um, people are so creative and it makes me so happy to see uh, what stories they tell of their communities. Black mothers have to tell our sons that keep your hands on the steering wheel, don't make any sudden moves, don't do anything, don't give them a reason. So yeah, black lives do matter. Actually, just recently, my grandpa was diagnosed with COVID uh, three weeks ago, and he just passed away uh, last week from it. So that's very close to me. And it has opened my eyes to realize maybe it's not like f fake news. Maybe it's real. So just got to take precautions. And like I said, do your research. And then when they were doing it with the tissue, I was like, for real? They're like, yeah, they're like, we have been a lot of trucks, a lot of trucks, people, they're getting pulled out the trucks. And they're like, man, we're looking for the tissue paper. That's crazy. Like, wow, it's amazing. I don't personally know anyone who's died over COVID-19, but I do know my, my homie was shot over the uh, quasi laws about um, mask coverings in a public commercial space. How you know somebody ain't tell that man, look, bro, we're gonna kill your whole family, bro, unless you make this happen, bro. Y'all seen it in the movies? Y'all like it's a game. This shit ain't no goddamn no game. Huh? Yeah, these, I mean, these are heavy questions. Yeah, 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 I'm bad at being put on the spot. I'm surprised I haven't said nothing too crazy. I'm known for saying some craziness, okay? So, I mean, after <laughs> there's no such thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he handled it so I kept looking over here like, is he okay? <laughs> he did good. No comment. You know, it was huge. So it was my first time being literally surrounded uh, with protests and uh, looting and riots. So it was the first time where I, I saw 10 protests and riots in a day, just where I was in Los Angeles and the first time where I've seen 10 helicopters circling my block. So my man laying on the ground and he ain't damn, he ain't struck, he ain't damn moving. And he, and he ain't busting no moves. He pissed me off. He pissed me off because I felt like, I felt like, bro, you black, bro. Fuck that gun, get the fuck up. If you can't breathe, you said you can't breathe, get your ass up off the fucking ground. Ain't no police gonna hold me down. Ain't no problem, I promise you on my life. They'll tell you I'm from Durham, North Carolina. It take when they when they come when they pull me over, when they pull me over, it be five, six, seven, eight police cars. I promise you, and it take five, six, seven, eight of them to get me down. And I still be cold cars talking shit. So I don't wanna hear that lay down. We don't lay down. Said you were so different 
but you lived a lie Now you have a chance, truth will set you free So give love a try before you lose everything Time to be smart and do it cause it's right Freedom and justice, we will never lose the fight It's true what they say, the pen mighty than the sword Now the people are united, we don't need you anymore As a god, see your deception, see through your facade. They weaponize the truth. You know it's nothing new. We arm ourselves with righteousness. We know what to do. We won't be silent. Time to stop the violence. Now we got the power, cause we spread the proper knowledge. They forever knowledge. Taking over college. You can be yourself. We don't need to rule and tyrant. And when we work together, we can end all this depression Without a mental progress, there will be no more progression How many more lives we're gonna spend upon this lesson? And justice anywhere, it's so justice everywhere The love is everywhere, and we came to make it clear We no longer bow to evil, we no longer live in fear Won't do your wicked bidding as the crowd begins to cheer How long have you known G-Shoes? I would say at least 17 years or more. Hmm. How long have I known G-Shoes? Mm. It feel like forever as long as I know my shoes, like as long as I known a pair of shoes, but it hasn't been. It's probably been for like Six years. It's a little over a year or so now. Um, I met him in my workplace. I would say about a year. How long have I known G Shoes? Uh, I want to say about 10, 11 years. Ooh, uh, maybe like, maybe 15 years. Oh my God. <laughs> I want to say over seven years now, maybe a Maybe, maybe about five, six years, let's say, be safe. What is the most memorable, most touching, or the funniest memory you have about G-Shoes? I would say um, just having him come by my place and performing, hearing, hearing, hearing him out, um, always had good advice, and we always, like, uh, we always had the music in common, so that was real cool. Literally, we outside his studio, sick larger studio. We recording, I'm shooting with my camera. G tell me he gonna kick the ball and we're gonna try to make like he kick it in the basketball, right? But you know G, you know G shoes, G kick it. You know that's where he get his name from, shoes, if y'all know that. He 
his foot like glue, like soccer player, like he's a he's a beast. So I say, I'm going to cut it, I'm going to edit it, G. I say, you just kick the ball, I'm going to film you kicking it. I'm going to say, I'm going to film just the, the ball going to the goal, and I'm going to edit it and put it together. I'm going to make it like you kicked it in the goal. He said, cool. He bounced the ball one time. I'm getting the camera ready. He kicked the ball, and I'm looking at him, and the ball goes dead in the net. Swish! And I'm saying, damn, he like, yo, yo, you get it on camera. I'm like, I'm like, nah, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like. After the ball went in the net, you know, I, I, I hit record, but it blew my mind, though. But you had to be there, but G, a motherfucker, he could kick. <laughs> I know he's very picky when it comes to what he puts in his body. Well, we do meal prep daily, so. We have a couple moments. Nothing really pops out at the mind at uh, at the time, rather. So, I'd probably say our daily interaction is always something that we laugh about and or smile. Going down to Venice Beach and meeting him for the first time, he was just he was comical. He was hilarious, and there was the situation when we made uh, California, where I was in his first video. And the police were there and he says, I don't have to go home. <laughs> I live here. And it was just funny because the police were just trying to harass, but he still made it. He stayed in his lane. When he had his uh, smoke shop in Venice and I used to be a crochet artist and uh, he was the first smoke shop to start selling my crochet lighter bags. <laughs> so <laughs> that, I remember that stood out because he was being supportive. Oh God, I think my funniest memory is um, going out to dinner one time. It was me and a group of friends. And I think we were just so happy. It was Friday. And um, we were just embarrassing him left and right to the point he says, I'm never going out to dinner with you guys anymore. <laughs> How do you feel about being part of this 10,000 Voices music video with G-Shoes and Alice? feel good. I appreciate the opportunity and, um, you know, let the people know what's going on around the world. It's a good thing. It's an unbelievable feeling, for real, because Sick Logic, G Shoes, the reason why I'm pouring this right here. He the reason why. He the reason why I lost 55 pounds. Ha! You know, lemon and water. So, um, it's, it's, a, it's a feeling. It's an unbelievable feeling. You have to be here to fit it and you have to know shoes and you have to be f following the sick logic message. You'll be have to, you, he'll show you the light. So it's, it's it, it feels like, like this, like this sticky liquid. What? It's an honor. It's an absolute honor. Good to be part of a movement, something great. I am a so happy to be here. It's also one of the first events that I've been to in like six months. It's the first time I'm seeing lots of humans at once. So it's, it's a big deal. It's something new for me. Uh, I've been a part of a couple videos, but this one has been a little bit more interesting. And um, it is, it's a new take on it. Uh, I like it though. I was honored to be asked, yeah. Well, it's actually exciting. It's good to, um, you know, hear anybody's voice. I spoke with G Shoes on the phone maybe not too long ago, and I actually told him that um, when you're of a certain race and you don't have to get involved with certain things, and you still put it all on the line to make sure that people are heard, people are understood, that fairness is kind of distributed across the board, that that's a really commendable thing to do. Yeah. How do you feel about putting together this 10,000 Voices music video? Oh man, I feel really, really good, you know? Sky's the limit. Basically, I reached out to the universe and the universe spoke. You know, it was about the people, for the people. So I had to invite some, you know, real organic, just the homies from back in the day. You know, some of these people I've known for a long time. It was cool to see people come out with different signs and different messages and you know, some people may even disagree, which is beautiful. The, the more um, you can get different point of views, the more whole the conversation is. And that's really what I'm trying to do with my movement, with Sick Logic, and with my book as well, which you can check into, which is called Alpha and Omega of the Soul. And it's, it's also the subtitle is A Holistic Exploration and Consciousness, because essentially it's about different experiences, different point of views, and 
you know, hearing from everybody. I have a theory that, you know, we're all a piece to the puzzle. And for us to see the big picture, we have to talk to everybody. We have to take our experiences from everybody So and everything. So that's why I tell people to, you know, to look into religious texts. I tell people to look into philosophy, look into politics, look into history, look into all of these things, look into science and psychology and sociology, epistemology and all the ologies, right? The isms, you know, look into these things so you can get a full spectrum and therefore come out much more knowledgeable because it's going to be very difficult to find 100% truth in any one thing or any one subject so you have to be very eclectic in the way that you go about gathering information and that's what this documentary the vision of this was to hear from different people and actually I'll start it from the music video I was like hey why don't y'all come out <clears throat> just put what you want to put on a sign and let's amplify that to the world and now we're about to hit the internet with that and get y'all doing it in in the house too. get y'all doing it on the streets whatever get y'all doing on your social media and you know that we're gonna do the 10,000 voices hashtag so that we can you know get people around the world into this global conversation it's really what I want to do is start a global conversation and I think one of the ways that we can improve society today is to be more sophisticated in our conversation you see a lot of the big conversations are done in the dark away from the people and it's time to change that it's time to shine the light on what's in the dark time to bring it into the forefront and let's hear from all people let's hear from all walks of life back to what i was saying i mean you're not going to find all truth in one side that's what's so interesting about it. that's why i want to hear from different people you're not going to find all the truth from this religion or you're not going to find all the, the truth from this branch of of science or from this color or that color or this side of the political spectrum or that side so you really if you are really interested in truth if you're truly interested in knowledge and wisdom then you'll learn from all people and that's what this is really about that's at the base and the heart of this 10,000 voices movement and this documentary is to say hey you all have something to teach us I doubt that anybody you've ever met, including myself, is 100% right from birth to death, okay? Nobody's 100% correct and knows everything, but we all know something. And therefore, you should go in any conversation assuming that you have something to learn from the other person. So, you know, I, I really just provided a forum, you know, I provided an avenue for a lot of these people to speak, and I was so blessed to get the feedback and get the excitement and have so many wonderful people come out and be a part of the music video and to be a part of the documentary. I have a lot of material coming out with Sick Logic and Alpha and Omega of the Soul, a holistic exploration of consciousness, which is now a book, an audio book, an ebook, and I've had over a hundred videos expounding upon the book just alone already on top of this documentary that we did today to personify the entire concept 10,000 voices and getting the voice of the people to the universe. Alright, this is my protest sign right here. Do your research, elevate your mind state. So it's just people need to do their research and not just take the media or Instagram or whatever they're getting the information from. Just do your research and know where you're getting this information and where you stand. Um, that's mainly it. Do your research and know who you stand for and what you represent. Mail on the track. Hey, y'all already knew. 
Y'all know I was bipolar, schizophrenic. Yes. That's what they call me. But yeah, this is what matters. You know? You see? Mental health matters. Mental health means everything to me, man. Because I am mental health. I'm the face. I'm you. You're me. We're champions. We're eagles. We're everywhere like the air. They're never there. We can't be stopped. We won't be stopped. I chose this sign because mental health, that's the only thing that matters other than the ecosystem. 50% mental health, 50% the ecosystem. For knowledge is infinite. Um, we should always be seeking to learn and um, overcome maybe our fears, learn what we perceive as different. Um, the more that you continue to seek knowledge, um, I think the more you grow as a human being. Um, and then, of course, being a black woman, uh, black is beautiful, um, with the emphasis on is, because sometimes, you know, it can be perceived. I mean, you think of a black cat, right? It's a negative notation when it comes to black. Um, I think people should stand proud in who they are. Um, and. I think I'm beautiful. <laughs> so my sign is conversation brings revelation. So what I truly believe is that some conversa conversations need to be had, meaning that we have all of this knowledge. One person has the answer, the other person has the question. I believe that's why we have a lot of confusion in this world. And having a revelation is, is more than just getting an answer. It's something that's uh, the next step above, like uh, supernatural, some would say. I think that we should, we should do what we can to cultivate as much creativity as we can in communities, give as many tools for creativity as we can. Um, so this is everything to me. I feel like a lot of people, um, you know, they, they make a lot of claims, but they don't put forth certain actions that uh, will back their claims, you know start to understand what's going on with your society, you know, with the laws. So get out there and vote on something or don't be mad when, when stuff happens. We're all as one. We eat, sleep, bleed the same. We die the same. There's no difference. Skin color should not ever be a division for people to hate each other. My sign says police the police. We're a government for the people, by the people. And um, the rules that apply to the people also apply to the police. So my sign says, if Black Lives Matter, vote. And the reason why I made this sign is because I know a lot of protests have went on. T 2020 was quite a year. And I wanted it to be more so we can't just make noise when things are uncomfortable or when it's popular or when social media is covering it. We still got to take the actions necessary to make the changes and we can't just take whatever is handed to us. We gotta make these changes ourselves and part of making these changes is by voting. Yeah, so if Black Lives Matter, vote. <laughs> I made two protest signs. Uh, the first one, again, is the 10,000 Voices protest sign, which is the voice of the people. I didn't tell anybody they had to do any one thing. I told them to speak their mind, speak their truth. And that's what it's about, you know? G Shoes featuring Alice, great feature on the song. So this is the single and the documentary that you're watching. We had the raised fist, which for those who don't know, is a symbol that dates back centuries. Essentially, it was started as a symbol against oppression. It was solidarity and unity against oppression. It stood for many things. Um, it stood for communism, to be honest with you. Um, it stood for, most importantly, in my eyes, revolution. Obviously, multiple factions over the years and over the centuries have adopted this raised fist, which again stands for revolution and has stand for things like black power and, uh, you know, the Black Panthers. And that's just to name a few, because again, there, this has a rich history with the raised fist. So um, the way I see it and the, the reason I represent it and feel the need to represent it is because it's revolutionary and anything that took the world to the next level in society was 
always a revolutionary action. And anytime the people became more free, um, nine times out of 10, it was from a revolutionary action. And there are many different forms and ways that revolution can be done. And I'm trying to elevate and evolve the way that we revolve. <laughs> so that brings me to my next sign, which is the evolution of revolution, which is the logo, it's the theme, the credo, if you will, of Sick Logic Records, the evolution of revolution. Because I have a saying again in my book, Alpha and Omega the Soul, what good is a revolution without an evolution? You see what I'm saying? So if you overthrow the powers that be, if you overthrow the government and you replace it with something worse or something more oppressive and something less freeing, then really what are you doing? You know, what are you, a lot of times tyrants have overthrown tyrants to become even more tyrannical, even become more oppressive. So we're trying to evolve. So yes, we need revolution, but we need an evolution of revolution. This is very, very important. And I think that it's crucial right now for the global conversation and the conversation that's going on in America, because we see a lot of people up in arms. And obviously, if you look into what's happened in 2020 in America and around the world, a lot of people are just in wanting something to happen and we need something to happen. We need something now, but we need to plan. We need to be smart because if you're devolving, then the revolution is not gonna be beneficial. It's not gonna be what you want. And this very systematic, long-term way of thinking. You have to really have planning in mind. You really have to have long-term thinking in mind for society to really improve. Because if you just say, hey, let's take out this police force, or hey, let's take out this governor, or let's take out this president, or oh, we'll, we'll topple um, this oppressor, and you come up with something worse, worse infrastructure, worse legislature, you could have a very, very ugly situation very, very fast. And we did see uh, degrees with that as well, with some of the riots that took place and some of the things, some of the, you know, movements that have been going on. And again, I'm with you, like we need something to happen, but I'm not with you as far as devolving society. So that's where we're coming in with the sick logic to really evolve the society. And that's where if you get into my work with the Alpha and Omega of the Soul uh, book, I have an entirely new psychological uh, model, a psychosocial model akin to uh, Maslow's hier hierarchy of needs. And it's a, like a super sophisticated um, version of Maslow's hier hierarchy of needs. Uh, has a lot of lineage to what is known as spiral dynamics, you know, which was founded by Claire Graves and then progressed further by Don Beck. If you look into things like spiral dynamics or if you're aware of uh, spiral dynamics, you'll have an idea of kind of where my model is rooted from and it's taking it to the next level or that's the idea. So again, mine is the holistic evolution of consciousness. It's a brand new psychological model to bring up society in levels of consciousness, both on the individual level and on the uh, sociological level. So that's what my signs mean. Um, 10,000 voices, once again, as I said, you know, it's, it's a hashtag, it's a single out now, and it's a documentary. So this is uh, what we are bringing to the table with Sick Logic. Being on the camera right here, the documentary, this is this is the closest thing I can remember right now, you know, because I live in the moment. So right now, right now, the feeling of riding out there, seeing them, yeah, seeing, seeing them on the ground and seeing them doing whatever they want to do around the town, it really hurt me and brought me down. It hurt my heart. It made me want to cry. It made me want to get a million dollars, a billion dollars and give it out and not be fly. I don't care about getting my hair cut. I don't care about none of that. 
I care about mental health because that's what matters. I'm looking on the street. This is my most memorable moment out there on the street on the way here. Tears came to my eyes. We have to start in the mind on the street. Mental health matters. The pandemic will definitely be the most memorable uh, thing that's ever happened in my lifetime. That's still, to this day, I don't believe it's happening. To me, it's just been a year of change. I think that the world is ready to finally embrace it. I think about like a couple of days ago, I almost died at work, but uh, it almost became an accident uh, with my truck. Yeah, I'm a, a truck driver, so you know, I move America around. When this first began, we were moving uh, tissue paper, and it was the first time ever we got warnings on moving tissue paper. It was like they were telling you, don't, don't pull over, don't stop. Uh, you got to drive like 200 miles before you can stop with the tissue paper because it was that, it, it, it was something that was just, it was gone. Water and everything, uh, water was a trip as well. So yeah, a lot of people's trucks had been, actually they were taken out of their trucks. A lot of people um, were taken out of their trucks at gunpoint. That was one of the main concerns was not getting out of your truck, uh, not, you know, keep on going, get to a safe place don't just stop anywhere so that was a big part of uh, 2020 for me another big change for me really is the fact that i can't really walk out of my house without my mask you know it's like i always got to have my mask you know no matter what you got to have a mask so yeah this is something very new for me I mean, usually when you pick up Apple products or something like that, like this, they're like, hey, this is very important. You can't stop anywhere. You just got to go. And then when they were doing it with the tissue, I was like, for real? They're like, yeah, they're like, we have been a lot of trucks, a lot of trucks. They're getting pulled out the trucks. And they're like, man, we're looking for the tissue paper. That's correct. Like, wow, it's amazing. Every ethnic background, every diverse person was out there and everyone took a stand for everything. The grocery stores are selling out of stuff. That probably stood out the most, seeing a grocery store uh, with empty shelves and like whole empty aisles. The only other time I've seen aisles like that was preparing for hurricanes in the south and everyone stocking up on stuff and you know the stores get sold out. So to see that over the pandemic, that was shocking to see that in here in California. <laughs> shocking the most memorable it would have to be some of the protests that took place um, on behalf of uh, George and um, many other members of the black community you know this whole thing with COVID was a whole new wave something that we've never experienced and the stuff with uh, the George Floyd killing you know, it was huge, so it was my first time being literally surrounded uh, with protests and looting and riots. So it was the first time where I, I saw 10 protests and riots in a day, just where I was in Los Angeles. And the first time where I've seen 10 helicopters circling my block. The death and the implementation of these new laws is probably the most memorable but again all the protests across the country like we've never seen before which expanded across the globe you know it's really it's really hard because we've never seen a quote-unquote pandemic like this before and i've never in my life witnessed a level of protest and unrest like this before and those two things combined at the same time is probably the most memorable thing of 2020, if not one of the most memorable things of my lifetime. I said, oh man, they bullshit. But then I thought about Trump. I said, hold up, now Trump, you know, I got to think about it. I got to do some research. So I did my research and I hit my mentors and I talked to my mentors and they told me, you know, what we knew it was. So we prepared, we was prepared and me and my family just stayed strong. It just whoop de whoop de whoop because 
Man, that COVID shit bullshit, but we'll get into that later because just if you get a common cold, don't take your ass to the hospital. Do not go to the hospital with a common cold because you're gonna have COVID. They're gonna give you COVID just because. You don't even hear about it. everybody gets sick now, it's COVID. What happened to a common cold? And there's no more common colds. If somebody could get the flu now, oh, it's COVID. What happened to the flu? Oh, it's just, oh, it's just a, a zip now? Come on, man, like COVID-19? What about the other 18? Come on, man, stop playing with us. You can play with them and not play with me because mental health matters. I think health is wealth, so. I, I, I can't really say the fear of it actually got to me. I mean, people die from the flu. It was the swine flu. So, I mean, you know, if you take care of your body, then it's miraculous. It's made to heal itself. So um, keep your immune system strong. It's just another flu season, if you ask me. I mostly felt, okay, we need to brace for impact because if it's hit China like it has, then I think that it's, you know, things are gonna have to change in the US pretty soon and life is gonna change. We're not as diligent as, I mean, you know, we're a democracy, China's not. So I think in some ways, um, when I first heard about the pandemic, when it was first announced, I thought, uh oh, all right, we're gonna do a shit job compared to China. So, um, oh no. Um. You know, really, I just thought it was another situation. You know, we've we've gone through tuberculosis. It was it was killing a lot of people. You know, we've had the AIDS epidemic killing a lot of people. Um, I just felt like it was just another um, scientific experiment gone wrong, um, and and maybe it didn't go wrong. Maybe it went the way that they wanted it to go, but it was just something else new that we got to deal with and be more uh, aware of and another reason to be healthy to juice more and live life on a more healthier basis that was one of the reasons why i don't know COVID 19 to me it was just like you know you got to stay healthy you got to maintain health it just seemed like the world was coming to an end to see that everyone was scattering around no food on the shelves it just it looked like we were in our last days and I mean, all I can think about was how will we pay rent? How are we gonna pay bills if we have to stay home for those of us that have jobs and have to work? So as long as we continue to wear our mask and social distance and do everything, I think the pandemic will come around. So I wasn't surprised that they asked us to stay at home. I was actually shocked that it took us so long to get the order to stay at home because I feel like when Italy went on lockdown, we probably should have went on lockdown too. <laughs> you know, um, I must be honest, when they first told us that there was a such thing as COVID-19, I thought it was a joke and it was gonna be over in two weeks. I said, the government is plotting something and um, I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna stay home for two weeks, binge watch Netflix and go back to work later. So I thought. Um skeptical about a lot of things so I like to do my research from a holistic perspective again I like to hear all sides and then come to my conclusion and you know I'm a person who's been kind of following the dictates and following the inactions of the system and the multiple uh, global systems for some time and the societies behind the system and the think tanks and uh, the secret organizations and uh, foreign governments and you know all these things for uh, for quite some time so you know when this came out and it started just ticking every single box of let's say a fascist wish list or or let's go and say a globalist wish list it, it checked every single box of of like what a globalist could want um to happen to create this uh you know, thing that we've been talking about for so many years that we've heard presidents and, you know, super elite rich uh, talk about for years, this uh, quote unquote new world order and the thing you see on your dollar bill, you know, when all of these things, all these dominoes just magically lined up, it was a big um, warning sign for me. So, you know, of course I had to look into it and of course, you know, could have real life ramifications looking into the detriment of health. You know, I do understand and, and have respect for and appreciate the health of 
the country, the health of the globe, and the necessity to act and act fast. So again, you know, I, th I think that people went to both extremes and still are on both extremes on this question and this whole topic. So, you know, you'll find people that, again, like many conversations, they think that everyone on this side is all correct and this side has no idea what they're talking about. And then the people think that this side knows everything that's up, what's, what's up and what's going on, and this side has uh, no clue and they're completely lost. And, you know, I like to take information from all of them. So I do wish for health. I do wish for safety. I don't trust the quote unquote powers that be to have our best interests in mind. So this is where there might may be a gap between the uh, juxtaposition between my take on it and other individuals take on it. So, you know, I try to be as healthy as I can. I try to eat as healthy as I can, live as healthy as I can. I'm trying to exercise. I'm trying to get sunlight. I'm trying to breathe fresh air. I'm, a, I'm almost like what you would say a germaphobe before and during COVID where I, you know, I stay very clean. I wash my hands. I, I even make sure that nobody talks over my food and I'm just, you know, very kind of a hygienic individual. I, I want to be as aware as, a pos as possible, but also I want to be with the awareness, not only on a physical level, but on a, a mental and spiritual level, and ultimately a global and universal level. And, you know, I, I see big warning signs. And so when I first heard it, you know, for, for people that, that look into stuff like this for, for the last 20 years, you know, it, it's, it, it threw up a lot of red flags for me. Let's just say that for starters. Actually, just recently, my grandpa was diagnosed with COVID uh, three weeks ago, and he just passed away uh, last week from it. So that's very close to me. And it has opened my eyes to realize maybe it's not like f fake news, maybe it's real. So just got to take precautions. And like I said, do your research. Yeah, my um, two chain DJ, my homeboy, he said, he got COVID and it, 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 shot, it shot me. Then my homegirl, Chef Jewel in North Carolina, her aunt passed away from COVID and it shot me because before they got it, I said, black people, we can't catch COVID. I was like, I ain't even, you know what I'm saying? I was like, shit. You know, because I went around asking all the homeless people and I did like a little survey and no, I couldn't find nobody and they couldn't find nobody. They didn't know nobody that had COVID. And I was thinking like, if somebody should have COVID, it should be a homeless person or, you know, somebody on the street that's, you know, in their own feces or whatever, just doing whatever they do. They didn't get sick, so. But when I heard a couple people, it shocked me. So yeah, I, you know, I masked up and I, I, I washed my hands. I follow the rules, don't trip. I'm just talking, yeah, but I still follow the rules though. But um, my immune system is great and I work out, so I know I'm straight. My roommate, um, I definitely know it's real. My roommate's mother uh, uh, tested positive. Um, I can't say anyone in my direct family, um, but I know it does exist. I'm not trying to be little or dismiss it, but um, how you care for yourself, you know, ultimately determines that. And though her mother contracted it, she didn't pass away. So again, like I said, the body will take care of itself. I have not. No. Um, a couple guys I went to school with, I haven't seen them in years, I've seen them on Facebook, um, a couple friends, they came across it, they were quarantined, but um, they're, they're, they're well and they're well now. The people that I have um, heard about, I've heard about maybe two or three, maybe they might have passed, but we haven't got a, a for sure if they pass for that or if it was something else. So blessings to their families. Everybody's been affected by it. I don't know anybody um, 
Actually, I do have maybe like one friend of the family that was infected by COVID. And I've had a few um, distant family members um, that have died from COVID. No, um, thank God. I've been very fortunate. My whole family is healthy, yes. Okay, I have not been affected by COVID-19 to any way of my capacity of knowing. Um, in the last four years, I got sick one time, which I believe it was in late November of 2019, which was cold flu-like symptoms. It's the first time I got a cold or flu in the last four years, which is a little bit funny because I haven't got a cold or flu in four years um, since I've been vegan or I converted to 99% vegan. Um, you know, and that's not, again, to brag. Some people feel like that's bragging or whatever. I'm just reporting my data, my personal experience. I've never gotten sick um, since I was a fairly healthy vegan. I did one time in November 2019. Some people claim to have experienced some COVID earlier, you know, than we found out in, in February or March or some say January. Some say they did experience something funny in 2019. I'm not saying I did. I'm just saying that, you know, it was a little iffy that I got um, sick, which of course I'm not saying I'm immune to, to sickness or anything like that, but it, you know, it did stand out in the last four years. So I personally have zero in influence or infection from COVID-19 or experience with it myself personally, or anybody that I know. I personally, I'm here in what's supposed to be like ground zero in America, ground zero in Los Angeles, California one of the, you know, the hotbeds of this COVID-19. I personally, I know a fair amount of people, I don't know one person personally that has at least told me or had a conversation with me that has been affected with COVID-19. However, I do know people who have known people. I know several people because I've been asking around. Again, I've been trying to pull information from everybody. So I ask, you know, I've asked some of my doctor friends and some of my nurse friends, you know, what they think about this and some of my friends, what their experience. And I can account for several experiences from different people, some people that have gotten sick over it. Um, they know people that have gotten sick um, with quote unquote COVID-19. And I know um, some people that have, that know people who have died, most of them older in age with uh, pre-existing conditions, but have died from quote unquote uh, COVID-19. So, you know, that would be about the extent of my experience personally, without going into depth about what the doctors and the nurses told me, all the doctors and nurses I've talked to, which are my personal friends, one of them used to be my employee, et cetera. And they have told me uh, that it's, you know, very serious and to take it very serious and they've, uh, a lot of them have dealt with it head on and, you know, are very um, concerned. And some of them uh, have told me that they, they feel from their experience that it's very irregular and that it could be um, highly possible to be manipulated in a laboratory and, you know, different from anything that they'd known. So, you know, I've been accumulating a lot of knowledge uh, from different people to try to you know, reach my ultimate conclusion. So I'm still learning, as we all are, as this uh, pandemic or quote-unquote scamdemic continues. I personally haven't had any anything happen to anybody that I know of that has told me. I do know someone that, <clears throat> I do know someone else who knows someone who could, couldn't get to the doctor and died because they basically couldn't get to the doctor because they were so concerned with COVID-19. And then I also have a friend, he went into a convenience store, I believe he had a flat tire, the homie uh, Madhead, which you can look into this, Los Angeles. The homie Madhead ran into a convenience store, he had a flat tire, he wanted to run in and out. I don't know all of the details, but he didn't want to wear a mask. He, he said he was hot. His, one of the last words he said was, I can't breathe. They told him to put on a mask, etc. The security guard told him to put on a mask. He said, I'm hot. I can't breathe. I don't want to wear the mask. He wanted to be in and out, mind his own business. And this man got uh, you know, into an altercation with the security guard, which you know, felt the need to take it to a physical level over a quote unquote health. He wanted you know, physically 
threaten and manhandle this man who is, you know, a, a good-hearted dude who went in here and 99.9% .9 wasn't sick, 99.9% .9 wasn't going to affect anybody if he did. And, you know, as you know, 99.9% .9 of people who are infected, you know, nothing really extreme happens anyway or, or death doesn't occur for that matter anyway. But regardless, um, he, he went into the convenience store. He was essentially manhandled by the security guards. So they got into an altercation, uh, which led to uh, Madhead, uh, the homie Jay, coming out of the um, convenience store and then got shot in the back by the security guard. So I do know a friend who died over not wearing a mask in a convenience store. I don't personally know anyone who's died over COVID-19, but I do know my, my homie was shot over the uh, quasi laws about um, mask coverings in a public commercial space. COVID-19 infection rates and statistics are accurate? Hell no. You know it's not accurate. Nothing's accurate. Only thing accurate, I, I damn near can't even piss in the toilet bowl. Accurate. It's not accurate. What's accurate? What's, what's, what's accurate? What's, what's the definition of accurate? Who wrote the definition of accurate? Who wrote definitions? Period. Accurate. Ain't nothing accurate. Only thing accurate is is mental health matters in the ecosystem, 50-50. That's the only thing that's accurate. No, I don't believe the current statistics on COVID-19 are accurate because not everyone's getting a test. And also it's, I mean, most people that have COVID don't show symptoms, so they wouldn't get a test anyway. I think a lot more people have had it, obviously, than we have the numbers on. Usually it takes 10 to 20 years of data to give you a, a good analysis on it. I feel like maybe they're skewed. They say you have some false positives and there's a lot of tests that I believe that has not yet come back. Um, so we're still waiting for results, but um, I think the statistics are probably, it could be a little bit higher and then it could be a little bit lower, but the testing. No. I feel that they're very inaccurate. I feel that COVID was killing people in America before they were calling it COVID. I feel a lot of people that died of what they thought was a pneumonia or a heart attack early in the year was probably COVID related. We'll never really know how many people really had COVID. I personally do not believe that the um, infection rates of the COVID-19 have been kept up with the data. I believe that there was a period when it was so fresh that we just kind of checked everything off as COVID, COVID, COVID. I believe that people had COVID-19 long before we knew that we had COVID-19. I believe that it's easier for the hospitals under all the pressure that they're under to just say COVID and mark it off. We will never know the accurate data, data um, for the COVID-19. Statistics by nature are going to be skewed. It's very hard to get any kind of real poll or real statistic. Um, those are most often skewed, so it can be very dangerous to make huge decisions based off statistics in general. Of course, we have to use the information that we have. So again, I'm not trying to propose any one-sided story here. I'm really trying to have a real conversation. So I'm not saying these people are all right, these people are all right. I'm trying to say you're both right and you're both wrong. And I'm sure I'm right and I'm wrong by nature. That's the nature of human as none of us are perfect. Some of the things you've heard politicians say and news say and, and um, independent reporters, some of them have a lot of truth and some of them are also false as well. So that's something to look into anytime you're reading a, a book or talking to a friend or listening to music. You know, this is something to keep in mind for a mature, sophisticated adult who's really interested in truth. So, yeah, I'm interested in truth. Um, can the statistics be super reliable? I mean, clearly no. In the beginning, they were um, based primarily off of symptoms. And anyone with the flu-like symptom 
um, well, I don't want to go as far as to say anyone, but many who had flu-like symptoms were diagnosed with COVID. And then, of course, many people who have died with pre-existing conditions, whether they're 70, 80, 90 years old, and they died with COVID, had COVID on the death certificate. So that's not anything extreme. I'm not trying to go really out on a limb here. It's just, I mean, that's pretty factual. You know, a lot of people were reported to have died from COVID-19 with, without the rig rigorous method that would usually be applied to one when they're placed on a death certificate under a certain criteria of death. I don't hear too much about uh, autopsies. I find that a little, little bit fishy. So statistics in general are usually skewed. I think these, particularly in the very beginning, are extremely skewed. And then now, um, I don't think these tests are also perfect either. I think these tests are pretty questionable. Uh, if you look into some of these uh, tests that they're using uh, to diagnose COVID-19. And there's a lot of material which can be looked into regarding that. So something to look into. I'm not gonna say I have the definitive answer, but I would also warn those for believing that anyone else does. Because to be honest with you, I think it's pretty cut and dry that no one has these definitive answers. and you got to be skeptical about statistics in general. But again, they do give you information. Just hopefully the people that are applying these statistics and checking off these certificates and collecting money for uh, certain things from the state or the government are doing it in good faith and with good intention because these things are important. And clearly you see now, like never before, how we make decisions sometimes you know, overnight decisions based on statistics. So it's something to be very, very mindful, especially when uh, certain people have billions to profit or even beyond money, they have a lot of power and legislation and um, a lot of their agendas coming to play or coming to fruition to, to benefit from these statistics. So something to be very, very mindful of where they come from, and how they're created. What are your personal feelings about mandatory masks and how effective do, they, do you feel they are? Now, how I feel about masks since, um, since I had my grandpa passed away, I'm more worried about, not about me catching COVID, but me giving it to an older person or my mom or my dad and they're getting it. So if it helps, I'm with it. Oh man, the mandatory mask will kiss my mandatory ass. Cause I'm trying to tell you, mandatory mask, Biden, man, with that bull job. Biden, stop playing, man. Go to sleep with that, man. Trump, man, I, 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 I mess with you, Trump. Let's do it. Trump 220, man. Reopen them doors, okay? Get everything flowing. We're not trying. We got to rebuild the economy. Put the mask on. You put the mask on, so you trap the germs in your face. Trap the germs in your face. and right back in your face. I'm saying, look, so you're going to take the mask off sooner or later. They got mask off. I got a mask off. He got a mask on. She got a mask on. What the hell does a mask matter? It's a man walking over there with a kid with no mask on. You think the wind's not blowing, the shit blowing in the air. Not no damn mask matter, that shit don't matter. Where I'm from, we can't wear masks. Cause when I was in school, ninth grade, I got a charge for um, robbing a hotel. They call it common law robbery. We went in there with mask on. So when they were going to stores, Halloween, we can't wear masks where I'm from. That shit all new to me. This shit new to me, this mask shit. So when I go in stores, I take my mask off. You know, just common logic, because where I'm from, you know, when we go in the store, whoop the whoop the woo with a mask on, get out, give me the money, ha, flop, live it up, man, I ain't going to hurt nobody, I ain't going to hurt nobody. You hear what I'm saying? We waving, yeah. So I'm trying to tell you, come on, man, a mask? Fuck a man. Mental health matters in the ecosystem. Sick logic, man. Follow G Shoes, man. Triple logic, man. His recipe, man. Get you some water. Get you some lemons. Put a little marijuana leaves in it and sip and chill, man. Fast. Intermediate fasting. Save the bees. Without the bees, it'll be no trees. It'll be no breeze. Y'all stepping and killing bees. Y'all scared of bees, but you'll shoot a pistol. I see people, I see people run from bees and swat and kill my bees. Kill a bee around me. 
Please don't do it. I don't want you to do it. Don't do it. I'm begging you not to do it. Come on now. The bees, the ants, the ecosystem. You got your dogs pooping out here. You ain't picking up your dog poop. Get it right. Don't nothing else matter. No ecosystem, no us. Mental health. You don't get these people off the street. They're going to start coming in your damn houses. And, and guess what? No, you can't protect your house because you, can't, you can't, can't even protect your damn mouth. Write checks that your ass can't cash. And I'm telling you, you see the signs, they say eat the rich. They're gonna eat y'all. I'm gonna be rich as hell and I'm still gonna have a ball because ain't nobody gonna fuck with me nor mine. But I'm trying to tell you, y'all better mental health, God dog it. Triple G shoes, sick logic, you heard. I just say better be safe than sorry. Uh, I do think it's ridiculous, but at the same time, with life goes on. So if you have to be in compliance, then you have to be in compliance. Um, however, I still think it's a little ridiculous, like seeing people driving alone in their car, you know, and they have their mask on. It, it's, it becomes, I guess, habitual in a, a sense. I think uh, people are in somewhat of a trance. It's just become regular, so. Listen to different documentaries and, and small excerpts, clips from doctors. The masks are not really helping us. A piece of cloth, a piece of fabric, Unless it's like the N95, I, I really don't believe that it's helping us. It's actually harming us. It's been pretty clear that masks do make an impact. If you actually listen to scientists and doctors, um, I have a lot of friends that work in ERs and they're desperate for people to wear masks more often. Their sentiment it seems like they're sentiment has mostly been like it's a piece of fabric so it's not that big of a deal just put it on you know uh, I it kind of it kind of bugs me that there's so many people that are so anti-mask um, and it feels unnecessary to me it's just a piece of fabric I use I usually work in warehouses where we got a lot of dust you know I'm, I'm forklifting boxes that have been sitting in mildew for the last three, four months, you know? So I usually wear a mask, you know? I'm, I'm always, I have like a whole bunch of masks. When they were saying that it's mandatory for us to wear masks, I kind of, to me it was like, oh, I don't really, you know, this is something that I do all the time. Anyway, I'm working 12 hour shifts when I'm driving. Sometimes I'm, I'm hauling dirt and I gotta put the mask on. So, I, cause I don't breathe in, I don't wanna be breathing all the dirt, all the cement dust or whatever, so. Me personally, it's not a problem for me, but the problem is is when I don't have it and I want to go into the store just to grab some real quick and it's like, oh, I don't have I can't even go in the store. Like, so that's the it's iffy, but I mean if if it keeps me living, why not? Why not? If it if it keeps something bad from me, I'd rather take the chance of being mad about my mask than to be worried about, oh, I should have the freedom not to wear it, you know? It's like, it's about life. <laughs> yeah. What are my feelings on the mandatory mask? Well, for a person who has asthma as myself, I'm not crazy about wearing the mask, but at the end of the day, if it's going to help us to get rid of the pandemic, and what's going on in COVID, why not? Now this is our new normal. And sometimes we forget it going to the grocery stores or whatever because we're not used to it. But I always say keep a spare and you'll be ready. But at the end of the day, this is something that we just have to get used to for now. Okay, so I'm just gonna tell you what the CDC said. Okay, they say that a mask will not protect you from catching the virus. The mask may help you from spreading the virus. And that only works if you are wearing a clean mask. Okay, we are here in October. If you've been wearing the same mask every day since March, that's not good. That's not helping fight the virus. I think any step or any measurement, um, we should take it seriously and we should definitely put it in play. I don't know how I don't know how much it um, stops the outbreak on COVID, but I do know that we should be wearing our masks as I'm not wearing one, but <laughs> we should definitely take it serious and we should wear the mask. Again, these statistics can be skewed as they often are. I think we have reason to believe that there was a lot of 
foul play and a lot of exaggeration on some of these statistics and that the testing is not completely accurate about this uh, disease that we're still learning, admittedly learning about a lot um, as we go on. So, you know, we kind of made these decisions once again overnight, including the face mask and things like that, before we even knew it was scientifically proven uh, or it's still not really scientifically conclusive that they are super functional. Just the mask alone, that, that in itself is a whole uh, talking point. But when you look at the fact that people, most people are not washing their mask every day or, or every time they go out, people are coughing, sneezing, breathing into the mask. There's so many ways and, and you know, the CDC and you know, the WHO and every, everybody has t at one point they said not to wear the mask. Now they're saying the masks are essential and you're crazy and you're, you're a derelict if you don't have a mask. So, you know, it's, it's very lopsided. It's a lot of contradictions. I'm not saying they're not effective. Um, uh, you know, I think common sense would, would, would state that they do slow down um, your, your pathways, they do slow down droplets and can eliminate droplets. So I think that, you know, common, state, uh, common sense would state that alone and scientific uh, reports have shown this as well. But then also um, there's the fact that the microns from the virus are so much smaller than the holes in the mask that, you know, so much can get through. It's really not a foolproof plan as everyone admits, you know, it's, it's more so a deterrent. How effective as a deterrent is it? Well, that, that comes down to um, hygiene and protocol. When people aren't putting on a, f a fresh mask every time they go out and they're reusing it, you know, and myself included, like I don't wash my mask every time and I don't really, you know, I, I haven't been um, as, let's say, heavy duty or fanatical or um, on board with this whole mask presentation because again uh, we have to pay okay we have to pay for these masks ourselves right no, nobody's washing them um, since COVID-19 has occurred I've seen three people sneeze two sneeze into the wind outside and I've seen one person sneeze into their mask three people since COVID-19 I've seen sneeze one of them into a mask two of them outside the two is very early on, so let's let's just forget about the two. We have the one person sneezed in the mask and kept on wearing the mask. Okay, so now let's say they're sick. Now they're reinfecting themselves, and they're also when they when they're breathing out and they're talking, they're yelling, etc. They have a chance that they're actually they have that um, quote unquote virus, which they are spreading to others because it's still within their mask, and so people aren't cleaning these masks so that's where it, it you know science is not always so cut and dry Sci a, a real sophisticated science takes a lot of study it takes years and years of thorough study to come to any kind of conclusive evidence so yeah if we all wore a clean mask every single time we you know we went out I think that could be a semi effective deterrent Perhaps again if you're not touching the mask and that's a whole other thing too when people are touching the mask and you're touching yourself and they talk about um, An over exaggerated over exaggerated confidence because okay now I have a mask. I'm I'm confident I'm going into public more and now I can go into public or now I can get closer to people so there's so many different facets of this mask conversation that are being had in a super legitimate or holistic way um so was i a big fan of jumping on the mandatory masks no i'm really more of a voluntary type of individual um i think we need to improve our communication and our education and our um our truth finding methods because if we improve our communication and if we improve our knowledge base then and, and our um, societal morale, then society will naturally behave in a more sustainable, a more eco-friendly, a more uh, symbiotic way with society, a more empathetic way with society. Naturally, we'll behave better as society 
and make better decisions as we become more educated, more knowledgeable, more wisdom, and key component as we increase our communication. So that's kind of the key of this underlying message here with 10,000 voices is that we want to you know, bring the communication to the next level and we want to give real people a voice. And we don't want to shut up and say, no, you're not allowed if you believe this. No, you know, that's why I invited some real people to have a real discussion. To recap, I think that masks have potential to be beneficial at this. Do they have harming effects? Do you have loss of oxygen? Do you breathe in more carbon monoxide? You know, the, do, you, do you become more confident and to go do things or, or behave in ways that you wouldn't if you didn't have the mask? You know, these things, they can become a broad scientific question and they can even become science, uh, philosophical and then you get into things like the constitution you get into you know when they're changing laws overnight you know i'm not really with that i'm not really with um giving our masters or oppressors what they want when they harm us or put us through a crisis so no i'm not really big on um new laws based on crisis i would um highly recommend people to be very, very cautious about implementing and enforcing and acquiescing to fascist laws and tyrannical laws and oppressive laws overnight, particularly based on crisis, which again, we have to react fast. So there's that part of the story. We have to do something now. You know, something has to be done. So, you know, these are things that we should have planned long in advance. And this is, again, why we need to become more educated as a public, become more educated in the field of science and to where we need to implement a little bit more of our uh, high quality philosophy with our science so that we're not um, reacting. I think that was very reactionary. Planning for the future would be the wise way to go. I think that we have a long way to go uh, with our knowledge base so that we can avoid being duped into falling into traps. So that's not to say that they're not effective in any way, but it's uh, to say to be mindful about new legislature passed overnight unconstitutionally um, and without scientific premises. How do you feel about mandatory COVID-19 vaccines and are you looking forward to receiving the vaccine as soon as it comes out? How I feel about COVID vaccines, um, I'm against that. Um, I'm not going to get no vaccine from the government. I don't know what's in it. I don't trust them. So um, that's where I stand, no vaccines. No, 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 no. No on all levels. No. I don't believe in it. Uh, how could I believe in something that no one really has a handle on and it's been the extended period of time? So if it happens, if they do come up with something, I will definitely have to look into it for myself, research it, uh, and have a full understanding before I can say I feel good about it. But as of right now, I don't feel good. No, I probably will not take the vaccine at least as soon as it comes out, um, or for the first year or two, because there are so many mutations of, or, I mean, as far, I'm not a scientist, but as far as I know, it seems like there are so many mutations of the virus. Um, and uh, I don't think, um, given what I also know about vaccines, I don't think we could possibly um, guarantee that that would protect ourselves against coronavirus. Personally, I feel like um, I keep my health a little bit stronger. I, I, I put a lot of good things in my body. I stay working out Ox Gym. That's my gym. I'm Ox, that's my gym. Disease prevention, you know, helps your body fight against stuff. You know, uh, juicing. 
I love the juice. Uh, at least get a juice in your body once a day. I feel like I don't need to get the vaccine. Um, if it was a mandatory situation when I used to work in the hospital and I had to, uh, they, they, they forced us to take the shot. You know, I, nothing happened to me. You know, I've heard people, bad stuff happened to them for taking a flu shot, but nothing happened to me for the flu shot. So at the moment, you know, if they're not pressuring me to take it, I, I'm not really worried about it unless I, you know, it was a must for, um, you know, my job. And then it's like, I like this, the 10 year situation where it's like, they've been studying it. They know what's working they know what's not working. I don't want anything that's an experiment. I don't need any experimental drugs, you know, just something that they know is working. No, I feel like a vaccine is not synonymous with a cure. And vaccines typically benefit people that have not had the disease, you know. You get the measles uh, vaccine before you get the measles. You can't get the COVID vaccine after you've had COVID. And I feel like if I've made it this far through the pandemic with my own immune system and my own social distancing, that's my vaccine. I'm very mind mindful and skeptical about injection of multitude of chemicals into my body. Uh, I try to stay chemicals free. If at all possible, I try to stay away from chemicals as much as possible in pharmaceuticals, let alone inoculations. Um, you know, that's a big area of study. I'm not fully qualified to answer, but um, you know, there's a, a lot of people with a lot of opinions and a lot of research. And this is where I would ask people to be very mindful. And I do not believe in giving up my body or, or enforcing laws uh, for other people to um, give up their rights to what they do with their body. So that kind of answers that for, for me. It's kind of a personal decision. Do I know what's gonna happen in the future? No, but I'm extremely skeptical. I'm skeptical of these corporations and you know who funds the corporations. And again, the methodologies of the people and the reasoning and the agendas behind all of this. So you know, I think it could get very, very dark and dystopian very, very fast if we're not mindful. So I would urge people to do their due diligence to do their research and to make sure that they are making the informed decision and they are making the free decision to do so if they choose. And I personally, again, haven't seen any personal threat. I'm, I feel very helpful, very, very healthy. And, um, you know, I'm not going to be jumping on board to be any kind of lab rat of any chemical injections anytime soon. So my answer to that is no, and uh, I'm gonna have to go with the pro-choices on this and say my body, my choice, uh, I mean, you're gonna have to, you know, pretty much tie me down or kill me to, you know, to force something into my body, so there you go. Uh, when I heard about the killings of Floyd, um, I was uh, outraged, I was upset. It reminded me again of uh, Rodney King in the 1990s again. So um, it's been going on for years and hopefully we, we're gonna have to do something now about it and really, really make them feel our voice. If I say this shit out loud, they might get mad. I might not make it out of here, but guess what? He told me to keep it a billion and I'm gonna keep it a trillion. Man, I was so hot because I was hot the way we reacted. Because I feel like, okay, we smarter than that. Y'all gonna go ride and woo the woo the woo and take what you can take. Cause they, I was pissed off cause they came to my neighborhood and my PA played me and took my money. They stole from me cause they felt like my business was in the Beverly Hills area. I say, damn man. And they said they had a sign on my bank. My bank said everything closed and say, eat the rich. That was some bullshit. We supposed to make some negotiations or something. We supposed to hit somebody on the phone and say, look, um, if y'all don't do this and do this and do this, look, man, we're gonna do this. We should have gave them more time than that. But you gotta, gotta think about it. 
Because the man not gonna have the man knee on the man neck for no reason, right? I looked at the videotape, cause I, if you check my record, I got over 50 something of fractures. I'm gonna tell you, the police, when they give me action, I give it back. So my man laying on the ground and he ain't damn, he ain't struck, he ain't damn moving, and he and he ain't busting no moves. He pissed me off. He pissed me off cause he I felt like I felt like, bro, you black, bro. Fuck that gun. Get the fuck up. If you can't breathe, you said you can't breathe, get your ass up off the fucking ground. Ain't no police gonna hold me down. Ain't no police, I promise you on my life, they'll tell you I'm from Durham, North Carolina. It take when they when they come, when they pull me over, when they pull me over, it be five, six, seven, eight police cars. I promise you, and it take five, six, seven, eight of them to get me down. And I still be cold cars talking shit. So I don't wanna hear that lay down. We don't lay down. It was something wrong with that man. And then was something wrong with the man that had the foot on his neck. How you know somebody ain't tell that man, look, bro, we're going to kill your whole family, bro, unless you make this happen, bro. Y'all seen it in the movies? Y'all like it's a game. This shit ain't no goddamn no game. Huh? Yeah, and I was taking up for the police. Yeah, and I was talking shit about, yeah, and I don't care about, yeah, and I don't, yeah, and what, yeah. And you're going to, yeah, what to me? Nah, yeah. So I'm trying to tell you, like, man. You got to look at both sides of the damn thing, man. Like, like, look out the window, man. You got to look out the window and look in the window. Nah, man, fuck that, man. I'm taking up for both of them, man. Like, straight up, man, because cause them two people got into some shit, and, and the partners around them, they won't train. They supposed to told, you seen it on training day when the cop get out of line, when the cop get out of line, the partner's supposed to grab him by the neck and pull him up by his spine. Partner, you're tripping. But nah, he ain't had it there. Cause guess what? Man, he had his foot, his, his, bruh. If you got your knee on a lion neck, you got your knee on the bad neck. Hey, hey, bruh, hey, bruh, I got my knee on the bad neck. How the hell I'ma let up? If I let my knee up, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? He's scared as fuck. Y'all don't know what's going on. That man ain't gonna tell it. That man ain't gonna tell it. Somebody could have sent that CIA. Somebody, some um, boy, one of them deep service. Boy, I could tell y'all some shit. Woo, 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 woo. Y'all better get y'all a goddamn book. But y'all better start reading, bro. Excuse my language, but bro. Bro, I was pissed off when I heard that shit. And God bless and, and rest in peace to George Floyd and whoever else, because George Floyd ain't the first person that been killed. Nah, bro, I've been, man, and bro, fuck that, and I've been riding, I, and bro, and the reason why I ain't go outside and ride, and bro, the reason why I'm sitting out my mouth saying Trump 220, because guess what, when I was fighting for y'all, when y'all was sitting in school, straightening shit, and I was slapping the shit out of people, and checking people, and running shit, and telling y'all, nah, fuck that, it's time to go to war, and I was out there hustling, and on the block, and going to jail and shit, fuck by it, 1994, that's the only thing I go, yeah, go to prison, that's what the fuck happened. So I'm trying to tell y'all, I ain't with that goddamn capping. Bring that bullshit down my goddamn line. Damn, another one. They killed another one of us, you know? And why is it still okay? Um, why does it keep happening, you know? Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. It's sad. My heart heartfelt for his family. Um, I was pretty surprised, actually. I didn't want to watch the video initially, but when I did, I couldn't believe how many people just stood there. I mean, I would have caught a case um, tackling one of those officers. I mean, as a woman, like, I don't care. I don't condone wrong. I couldn't sit there and just watch. Um, so fear is a, a hell of a drug because I don't see how People just stood there. I just don't. I don't care if you're the police, you're still human. So they could have been stopped. We have to do better. We really have to do better. Yeah. I was embarrassed of our country. Almost embarrassed to be white, actually. You know, it's hard to say things like this, but the reality of America, we've been dealing with with murders of, uh, in, unjust murders of blacks for years. That's just the society that we live in. So when I first heard, of, when I first actually saw it because I saw the video of it, um, I had to start looking for it because I was like, what are they not telling me? 
that's what it was. It was like I saw what they sh what they were showing on social media, and I was like, well, there's another video. There's something else that's going on, and everything that I've heard about you know the prior situations about his relationship with the person that with the man that killed him you know he had a prior relationship with the with the with the officer who actually um, was on his neck you know uh, they knew each other from the past they worked together as well um, to know these things it's learning these things um, after when I first found out it changed uh, my view of things, but it's it's been this way since Emmett Till. Emmett Till, you know, he was murdered unjustly, young young black man, you know, because he uh, looked at um, supposedly he looked at uh, somebody the wrong way, and they didn't like the way he looked at them, so um, he ended up dying. He ended up being murdered and tortured to death. So this is just something that happens in America. Sandra Bland is another one. She um, she died and she had a prior relationship with the officers who murdered her as well. So when, when I first initially heard of the George Floyd situation, it, it just hit me in the face like an, another one. This is just another one. Um, just another one was going on in America. Wow, actually watching television at the time that it happened, I was totally devastated. I was outraged. We have to police the police because they don't follow their own rules, but they want us to follow them. And it's so unjust and unfair that it works out like that. And how do they get away with killing someone? Because if we were to do it, we'd been locked up under the jailhouse. I couldn't believe it. I was shocked to see it. Um, and then the more you heard about it, the, like, like maybe you heard about it, but you didn't see the video, or you saw part of the video. But then when you see the whole video, like the more you find out about it, the more heartbreaking it is. But more heartbreaking than that, George Floyd for me, that did not break my heart as much as the killing of Breonna Taylor because she was asleep in her home. She was an EMT and she was shot and didn't even get to see an EMT. She didn't get to go in a paramedic. She, you know, the ambulance did not pick her up from her house and she didn't get to go to the hospital. And for me, that was more heartbreaking. My initial reaction, killing a George Floyd, wow, I mean, this was something like uh, we never really seen before. Obviously, we've seen uh, the abuse of police, <laughs> and this goes back centuries, of course, to the beginning of time and the beginning of law enforcement and um, the rule of the church before that and the rule of kings and queens and you know it goes back to the end of time but you know in modern day you know obviously it brought up things like Rodney King just blatant uh, disregard and then to where we see uh, police get off scot-free nine, nine out of ten times and you know we have seen this happen over the years but on a level like this with the actual killing when it just physically didn't need to happen um, you know, you could look into more details like what, was this guy, you know, affected in any way? Was he susceptible to anything? And, you know, there, this, it's an ongoing investigation, so, but it's pretty clear for everybody to see that the excessive force was disgusting, appalling, and that the man was essentially, uh, allegedly murdered before millions, multiple millions of people, so it was, disgusting on a level like we've never seen before justice still hasn't been been brought and will it you know i don't know who knows maybe they're gonna wait for things to cool down and let them off like they did with rodney king you know which started the other riots in la um years ago and you know it still wasn't to this scale and now we have a man dead it was essentially a snuff film seen by by millions you know, I don't know the exact count, but I assume hundreds of millions and cause an uproar like never before. So my initial reaction was disgust and I was appalled and it's just like, you know, how can this continue to happen? And then there's the, you know, the, the fact that um, it continuously happens to black people and, you know, this, it shows us, it, it shows us, you know, how much further we have to go. It's like we've come a lot of way, a long way in a lot of aspects, but 
we still have so far to go that it's really insane and this kind of brought it to the forefront for America and the whole world and the whole world reacted so of course uh, you know it was emotional and it was disturbing to see anyone die but someone like that at the, at the hands of law enforcement when it just didn't need to happen it was ultimately disgusting and appalling and you know that's one of the reasons we're doing a documentary like this right now and a song like this because it's essential it's a crucial it's crucial that we speak up and you know we don't let things like this happen because absolute authority corrupts absolutely so it's something that we gotta really keep in check we the people gotta keep in check and it was said that freedom is eternal vigilance so we always have to be vigilant and mindful and we have to put ourselves in the position that you know this could have been me this could have been my father, my mother, my lover, my brother, my best friend. It could have been any of us, let alone if you're black or a minority. Um, you know, the police seem to be, you know, obviously certain people in this country and other countries as well have certain agendas and certain uh, xenophobias and certain racisms and, and prejudices and biases and, and are fully ready to act upon those things and when they're protected by the law because they have a little badge or a little piece of paper you know it's outright disgusting and it goes against everything we're supposed to stand for when we talk about protect and serve and when we talk about uh, free, being a free country and the Constitution and everything else like that so um, it was beyond disturbing. Did you witness or were you part of any George Floyd Brand Taylor or Black Lives Matter protests? I was not a part of the protest for specific reasons. Um, safety. Did I believe in what they were doing and trying to make a change? The overall change, yes, I do believe in that. But how they went about it, those ways are not my ways. Yeah. Um only one, but um, it was a, a peaceful protest. Yes, I do <laughs> plead the fifth on that uh, question right there. Uh, yes, I witnessed protests, um, but because of um, that time of where we were in the pandemic, I did not go out and protest because I felt I was safer being isolated. But I did participate by posting stuff online, you know, calling politicians and, you know, doing that from a, protesting from a distance. Oh gosh, no, I was not. <laughs> I was one of the Twitter bullies. I was on Facebook. I was using social media to speak out, post pictures, post data, to post the statistics and kind of educate from behind the scenes. I didn't feel that. Um, being out in the street with the COVID-19 was really a um, productive way in this time to handle that matter. I spoke about how I saw over probably 10 different protests and rallies and riots and lootings going on in, in my Los Angeles area uh, within the span of a couple days. Uh, one day I was in the crowd at a protest and it seemed very, very peaceful to me and seemed very um, eclectic and just people were spreading the message they weren't even yelling that loud it wasn't even nothing really crazy in my eyes and as I, I walked away went home 10 minutes later I found out that they burnt down cop cars and that you know stuff went ham so I was involved and I did witness several of them yes protests are effective? If so, what kind of protests are, more, are most effective? I think protests are effective, but to a certain extent, 
Um, we don't go, we don't need to go out and destroy our community to get our voice heard. Like we need we need our community. So that's how I feel about that. Yeah, they affect them. Them young people, bro. Man, I I ride for anybody standing up for anything of their own. You know what I'm saying? I like that. I like that. Stand up for yeah, yeah. You believe what you believe in? Stand up for it. Yeah. Yeah, it was effective. Yeah, it was effective. It effect. Yeah, it's a, it's still in the, it's effective. It's effective, but the wrong effect. I ain't gonna drown y'all long right there. Yeah, my my leg ticking. Yeah, put your put your leg on my neck, on my mama, on my life. At this point, uh, protests seem redundant, I guess, in the sense that we just keep doing it and then there's not much change. Everything's just kind of a play on emotion. I don't know if we really want change or we just like to talk about it, so, um, or want to feel a part of something. You know, we yell until the next devastating thing happens and then we move on to that. Uh, so I don't know how effective they are. Um, I know initially when you go back to like civil rights movement, things like that, um, people are a little bit more united. Um, and I'm talking about the black community when I say people, because <laughs> obviously they were fighting for something. Um, it's the reason we all can sit here today and, you know, uh, solidarity and, you know, not look at each other with bias, but, um, Somewhere along the line, something changed, and it's just a bunch of hoopla, so to speak. I do believe in protests, and peaceful protests are important, but you also have to have action and movement behind the protests. You just can't be aimlessly gathering. Yeah, it has to be, it has to be with a purpose, a motive. It has to have this whole uh, detail-orientated, well put together, well oil machine that's going to actually make a change. So if that happens and all of those uh, elements are aligned, I do believe in it. Yeah, I think that protests are, it, it's clear that protests are effective, but mostly if they're nonviolent and peaceful. It's really hard not to ostracize the other if you're not communicating in, in a way that could possibly be heard. Get to the source of the problem. We don't need any more protests. Do I think protests are effective? Yes, I do. I think they're very effective because one sound, one voice, and if everyone could come together and make that one voice, that one sound together, then it can be heard as well as pen and paper, petitions, everyone getting together, signing the petitions. Because we're a country for the people and by the people, the most effective uh, protest we have is our vote. Who we vote for and why we vote for them and what we ask them to do once they're in office is our most important protest. Mm, that's a hard question. <laughs> I want to be the person to say peaceful protest is the way to go, but I also have seen peaceful protests come and go. I want to be like, oh, you know, the riots is what really got people's attention. And I really kind of feel like if it wasn't for the riots, if it wasn't for people breaking in stores, if it wasn't for people really showing their butt during this time, would we really have been heard or would this have been just another protest that came and went? I think that it was necessary. I think any form of getting your voice heard is necessary. Anything that needs to be spoken on and for you to speak up and speak out, I, I grant anybody to do it at any time, anywhere, anyhow they can. Protests can be effective. They're not always effective. You know, I won't have time to really get into the sincerity and sophistication of these questions in this interview. I'll definitely be doing works on these in the future. Hopefully the other participants in this documentary came with some key essentials to cover these topics as well. But you know, in the past, protests have certainly um, gotten things done and pushed back against oppression and pushed back against tyranny and stuff like that and you know shown that hey we're not going to take this and we're going to speak up at the very least we're going to get information out we're going to speak up we're going to say no we're going to put our foot down and put our actions to words so I think they can be very powerful and you know the most powerful like I said with what we're trying to do with the evolution of revolution is really 
um, informing people and becoming more sophisticated in the mind mentally and um, becoming more informed because when you have an informed public it's going to be very hard to enslave and oppress an informed empowered public so you know that's what we're trying to do is is strengthen the communication with the public and bring the conversation further so that we can hear from all people and become more sophisticated and really evolve the way we deal with these things because yes protests can be effective but there can be also very effective ways and different ways to to protest and to um to say no and to say i won't be a part of this and you know that's a big part of what sick logic is about and what we're doing with the evolution of revolution and my whole work with the alpha and omega of the soul where i'm coming with new psychosocial uh models for the world to learn from so really i'm i'm hitting the internet hard i'm hitting you know i'm hitting hitting them with music i'm hitting them with books i'm hitting them with knowledge and gems so that we can be stronger as a people and ultimately it comes to unity all this divisiveness is what's keeping us down and that's a big part of the protocol and the oppressor's agenda is to keep us divided so that's why we had to come together again with this message you see in my works and you see throughout my life you know it's very diverse and that's why we have the the revolutionary fists of all color it's not about revolving for one color or one state or one political agenda or ideology it's about a multitude of opinions and voices coming together working together to say we will no longer be oppressed and we will not take injustice for these people or those people or any of our people because we're all brothers and sisters and that's what it's about for me What do you think about Black Lives Matter as a meaning? And separately, what are your thoughts on Black Lives Matter as an organization? As an organization? We started an organization, Black Lives Matter. I ain't get the memo. Because cause, cause, um, as far as I'm concerned, we've been organized. You feel what I'm saying? But um, what people don't understand is this shit is a race. What's the definition of a race? Definition of a race, right? If we're in a race, black, white, Mexican, brown, Indians, Asians, it's a race. And we out to win, right? So um, what we don't understand is as our people, they just getting together as an organization. Nah, bro, we've been an organization. We got to stick together, okay? And, and by any means necessary, we have to... Um, Destroy your competition at all costs. 48 Laws of Power, that's the books that they're writing, Robert Greene, that's what they're reading. We have to study what they're studying. We have to beat them at their own game. If we can't beat them, we have to join them. You feel what I'm saying? Because they're not going to come down the ladder to help us. It's a race. Think in your head, help your people. They're going to help their people. Don't get mad if they help their people and talk shit about us. I don't care about that. It's a race. Come on, who's going to win? Black life matter. Come on, man. All lives matter. Fuck that shit, man. I'm tired of hearing that BLM shit, man. Mental health matter. Fuck that. Fuck that. I'm tired of hearing black life. Got a triple G life. Triple G matter. Sick logic matter. WWW stay aware with Kavino the artist. Um, that matter. Mental health matter. I'm tired of that, man. I'm tired of that. Just one life, man. No, no, bro. The bees matter, man. What the hell y'all talking about, man? The bees, the plants, that matter, man. PLM, ELM, eco, ecosystem. Man, don't sit on us out, man. I hate that. Man, they did that, man. They did that. They tried to send us out, and then they got the brown community looking at me all wrong. No, I'm going to let you know what's going on. Y'all BLM. And there where I go to um, the brown looking at me like, yeah, they, 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 nah, bro, y'all should have been saying brown and black, bro, because we the same. How the hell y'all just going to put us out there and say black lives, man? Next question. As a meaning, I definitely understand um, that, hey, we, we're here, you know. 
two people can be pulled over um, or in court or the sentencing, I mean, everything like that. It makes sense of why, you know, we're shouting Black Lives Matter. I think we have to see our own worth, I guess is what I'm trying to say. As black people, I feel I'm a descendant of kings and queens. So a lot of people think of slavery and that's where we, they think we started. And so I don't know if they really believe that Black Lives Matter or are they just move, looking at it as a movement. So if that answers the question. As far as the organization, um, again, when you start using words like organization and, and, and the politics of it all, again, it, it can be lost in what it was meant to be. I am in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I feel like as a white person, um, I kind of need to stand back and just support and lift up where I can. If, if the organization is called Black Lives Matter, um, we need to start bringing an eye to that. And I think a lot of things are occurring that are not helping people understand that Black Lives Matter. They bring a blind eye on things. So the, the organization, I know it's meant to be good, but like I'm saying, there's, there's deep, it's deeper issues with Black Lives Matter that I think need to be uncovered. And those are the things that um, need to be focused on. Black Lives Matter is like, my life matters. So if I walk out my front door and I see I want my life to matter. It should mean that, you know, black people are just as important as any other type of people that we matter to. Um, the movement, I think it's an important movement to highlight the injustices that black people are experiencing. Because as a black woman, I get pulled over by a police officer. I know I haven't committed a crime, but I'm still terrified that I might not survive the stop. Oh, wow. OK, so Black Lives Matter, I think that its origin has been taken out of context. I believe that um, when Black Lives Matter was originally formed, it was meant for exactly what it's meant for. It was to get the voices heard of people that were getting injustice. Now, I believe that people have added their own touch and twist, and we've kind of lost what we were really standing for originally. But Black Lives Matter is necessary. Black lives do matter. I understand some people feel all lives matter. But black lives need to matter right here, right now, because it's the most suppressed race. As an organization, I'm not really sure when they created Black Lives Matter, they were really meant for it to become such a big and powerful uh, organization. I don't know. I know when I speak Black Lives Matter, I speak primarily about the race and the cause. Um, everything else that's included, I think people have put their own touches on it. So we'll just leave it there. OK, this is an excellent segue for my prior question to where I just said it was basically all about all togetherness, oneness, unity, we're all one people, we're all planetarians, we're all part of the same universe, we're all one, essentially. So Black Lives Matter is a powerful statement because it's saying that, hey, we matter. And, you know, obviously, black people within America have been oppressed for many, many years. It's gone for centuries since the beginning, essentially, of America. So, you know, again, you have a people stepping up and saying, <clears throat> we're not going to take this. We're going to stand up for our people. And, you know, these lives matter. And a lot of the, a lot of people in America still believe they don't matter. So this is why it's been created. And, and they show it and they show it with dictates and they show it with um, people getting away with, again, like we said, with the Rodney King and who knows what's going to happen with George Floyd. And it's been countless others, obviously, leading back to the beginning of chattel slavery in America, it's, you know, it's still to a point where it could be said to be systemic because these people, these people are protected by the badge and, and, and they're getting away with things. And so, um, you know, it was a powerful statement to say that black lives matter because they do. So it's a pretty airtight argument. <laughs> um, and then you ask about the organization. Um, you know, that's a whole deep conversation I can't really go into right now. Again, I'm, I'm off of a, another seven day fast and we just did, had, I had a big day, I'm off of four hours of sleep. So if I seem a little jittery, jitter, jittery or not altogether in my conversation questions today, I'm not really all the way there. Um, you know, I'm 
we're, we're kind of running out of time. So uh, for me to go in a question like that, you know, obviously I run the risk of offending so many people with anything like that. Like, you know, organizations, um, hopefully they have good intentions and I believe they do. And, you know, um, sometimes the road to hell was, you know, paved with good intentions. So, um, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of things about self-proclaimed Marxists um, and communists and, you know, within this agenda and this, this movement, which, again, that's a whole nother conversation, which we don't have a billion hours to really get into the depth of because there's a lot of beautiful things from communism and it's, it's a great uh, ideal at heart, a great intention to give the power back to the people, essentially the working class. But, you know, it's um, from what I have gathered, it's never really come to fruition. It's always, uh, the power has always been transferred to tyrants and then people have been more oppressed. So you know, these are very dangerous roads to go down. Ultimately, I would like to learn and, and encapsulate the greatest things that we have to learn from communism and socialism and capitalism and anarchy and uh, libertarianism and everything else and, and come up with the ultimate solution of finding the best gems from all of these and, and coming up with something better than all of them. That's really where my head is at. So an organization like this, I'm sure they're doing great things. Um, I don't have a super depth and knowledge about the organization. It's something I want to study more. But, um, you know, it's a big question that I can't fully tackle at this time. What are your thoughts on Antifa? Antifa. Oh, bro, you gotta elaborate. You gotta talk my terminology, bro. I ain't graduate from high school, bro. I ain't get out the ninth grade. What the hell did you just say? We can say next question. No, what do you? I want to know Antifa. what you just said. You gotta elaborate and inform me. I'm just reading this. Do you know what it is? I don't. <laughs> what the hell is Antifa? Latifa. All I know is Queen Latifa and Nefertiti. Um, all right, all right, go ahead. I think people have to do what they have to do. I don't believe in defunding the police entirely. I think, I mean, I know the message. I think the meaning of it's been misconstrued over the last few months a little bit. Um, and it doesn't mean totally defund the police. It's something different. So I think that um, my initial reaction to understanding a little bit about Antifa was we really have to work on our messaging so that the things that need to be heard will resonate with the people that it needs to resonate with. At the end of the day, Antifa's not here for, to support me at all or um, to support anything that I believe in. Uh, I, I feel like a lot of organizations, they have, their, their, they have another agenda. They don't have the agenda that um, basically to help so the society. I, I don't think they're um, something good for our society. Oh God, you know, no, I'm just kidding. My thoughts on Antifa are um, sometimes when people aren't heard and um, injustice is taking place, there needs to be different forms that step in and they do different things. So when Antifa comes in and they do whatever it is that they do, I really have nothing to say. People do what they feel fit. I don't want to go too deep into that one. Um, Antifa would be the exact, almost identical to the last question because Antifa is by nature, it's anti-fascist. So, you know, anyone who doesn't want fascism would be considered to be Antifa. So um, in that aspect, you know, I'm, I would definitely say that I'm not for fascism in any, any way. Um, you know, there's things to be learned from most of these spectrums, of political spectrums and, and, and sides of the spectrum. But this is one which I don't think bears a lot of fruit. I think uh, fascism is, is highly destructive and det detrimental to any society or um, country which it undertakes. So, you know, I would uh, <clears throat> go highly for the majority of the ideology of being against fascism. And then clearly, you know, within that name and title, there's been an umbrella 
which has been used to carry out many deeds, which I can't necessarily co-sign all of them. So again, that's a, a subject I can't really get into too much depth here because we don't have a thousand hours to cover such a subject like that. When you have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people enacting under an ideal, which the ideal may be pure at heart, but um, not all of the actions of the people operating under that ideal may be enacting in a pure manner. So um, that's probably the best way I could answer it at this time. racist yes I do believe we are systemically racist I think this whole country has been built on racism and we need to make a change hell yeah we racist because if we wouldn't be racist I mean well I just signed a piece of paper asked me what race was I, I mean shit I gotta tell them what race I am and it's a race you better know if we gonna run it and we gonna win it's shit bro and bro Bro, y'all count us out, bro. Y'all keep talking about Black Lives Matter and bro, everybody black. That's what I keep trying to tell y'all. And I'm an artist, and I'm gonna tell y'all like this. I see a canvas, and when I paint every fucking face, I go through that olive stage, of the olive green on a white man, on an Indian, on a black man. Everybody's black, man. I'm trying to tell you. Close your eyes, black. Open them up, blur, black. You know what I'm talking about? Black. You know what I'm talking about? Black. This everything's black, man. It's just black. You know what I'm For sure, black matter. Not Black Lives Matter. From my life experience and how I grew up, I would definitely have to say the odds were stacked, but it didn't change my mindset or who I wanted to become or who I wanted to be, regardless. I absolutely believe that America is systemically racist. We have so many problems in this country and all of our problems are systemic. So it's like a big Gordian knot that we have to somehow figure out. We have to get some really good engineers. We should, we should um, invent something called like culture engineers because we really need people to figure out how to go to the root of problems and then like unravel them. Everything's systemic. Definitely. Hierarchies in America, all the hierarchies in America are racist. All the institutions, they're based on racism. Even the ones that we think are not, they are. It's, it's a lot of separation. And, and that's the main problem with the systematic um, separation in America. For the most part, yeah. Because you couldn't get a job if you wore your hair a certain way. Or if your name, if you had an ethnic type name that they felt you couldn't get a job. I don't believe that the Constitution is racist, which is, you know, the founding of the country, but I feel that some people have positioned themselves in ways to make sure that they get more advantages than other people. Absolutely. Even if I wanted to not believe it, it's so obvious. <laughs> it's right in my face every day, every which way we look. Okay, so America was essentially founded off of racism, right, because we came here and we essentially decimated and genocided an entire people, and then uh, shortly after started enslaving people, which again, enslavement was really the, the, the way that things were done back in the day with kings and queens, and we came here over here with the ideology or the philosophy of freedom but when we came it was more so freedom for the few not for all and then we went straight into slavery which turned into segregation over time and you know it, it's a whole long story again we don't have a million hours to go in the history of, of america or the world but that's just kind of a quick rundown right so um it's always been built off of racism People are always going to have natural biases, and that's something that can never be completely eradicated. In every country, you're going to have a majority and a mi minority. And at times, the majority can use their powers to stifle and oppress and to do injustice to the minority. And surely, America, as 
eclectic and as big of a melting pot as we are and as far as we've come in comparison to many other countries over time, uh, surely we have not reached the apex to where, you know, we haven't uh, reached the summit by any means. You know, we've come a long way, but things like, again, the George Floyd and, and so many others exemplify how real it is and how down in the trenches we still are and a lot of the people are still in the good old days and there's still a lot of good old boys across this country and we forget it sometimes when uh, some of you might be living in a rural town and you know we live in the city and we forget it we're here in Los Angeles one of the most diverse places in the world so when we're walking around and things are a certain way you know it may not be the same in in Kansas or Oklahoma or you know some of these other states things may be a little bit different so you know the scales vary depending where you are are. Ultimately, when you look into things like um, despotism and you look into um, certain counties and districts and, and, and sanctions um, being controlled by certain people, of course, you know, they have their uh, families in mind and their people and their allegiances in mind first before others. And, you know, America is still xenophobic and, and racist in, in so many ways that you know, um, we can't cover all this again tonight, but clearly when you have something like a Rodney King beating or you have something like a George Floyd incident or uh, so many countless others, again, I'm trying to limit these as best I can, but when you have some of these still happening day by day, year by year, and you still see them, I mean, there's some big gaps in these holes. I mean, we have a constitution, but so many things are unconstitutional, and we have a justice system, but it's not perfect, and it never will be perfect, but I know it can be much better, and that's what I'm attempting to do with things like this 10,000 Voices, where we're trying to elevate the con conversation, and we're trying to evolve the idea of revolution, and really, uh, you know, evolve society together without the divisiveness. So, you know, I'm just trying to do my part, and, um, and the divisiveness and look to a better way because again it comes down to knowledge and a lot of people are just ignorant and some people are happy being that way so and they don't know they don't know their own ignorance so you know um, that could oftentimes be the problem so the answer is yes and no um, in ID in in theory it's not but in practice clearly it is I would uh, make sure um, pedophiles get charged with the full extent um, and be lenient on the drug users because I don't know why drug dealers get more than um, child abusers. That's crazy. The presidents, um, the presidents, I, 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 this, 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 this should be the thing. We shouldn't have one president, we should have two presidents. We should have a Democratic side, we should have a Republican side. We should have the best side from the Democrats, we should have the best side from the Republicans. You feel what I'm saying? And then guess what we should do? We should let the Democrat have that thing, and we should have the Republican have that thing. Biden say this, Trump say this. Okay, now the people vote on which one you like. Because guess what? We all said the right um, um, to the Republic. You feel what I'm saying? So, that's what I would change. Like, I would change, I would rewrite a, um, the script, fuck a law, like, I don't buy by no damn laws, I just respect everything, man, I don't care about no law, but I would change that. I'm kind of Old Testament, you know, I think we should go back, I mean, it's pretty simple, you know, you, you steal, you get your arm cut off, I think less people would steal, I don't know, I think we should just police, police ourselves in a sense. I, I, I don't know, I always hear we the people, but we, um, we're we always looking to our government for a solution. Um, I mean, I think a lot of laws should be rewritten, but uh, I can't just say one, because uh, it's, it's all broken. Constitution, rewrite it. I think we really need to reconsider the Constitution 
reconsider the amendments and understand that everything is relative to the time that it was written during. So times change. A person who is on drugs or who has a drug problem that they are incarcerated and the, the three strikes and maybe they've done something and they go back for having an addiction and they're locked down for life. I, I don't get that part. Uh, I saw it. I think they should actually go to rehab, take the monies and funds that they have and build a rehabilitation center for those that are arrested for these crimes. I would make it illegal for a police officer to kill somebody that is suspected of a crime that would not also warrant the death penalty. You know, so should not escalate to where someone's being executed over a minor infraction. If it's not something that we would give someone the death penalty for, the police should not be able to execute them, period. You know what? Um... My husband has mentioned that maybe we should take a second look at the three strike law. Um, I think that history, we've went back a couple times and we've seen that, man, we've struck, we struck some people out that maybe may have not been able to or shouldn't have been stricken out. Or um, people have been stricken out on mar things as small as marijuana. And even though we as a country have said, oh, let's legalize it, they're still behind bars. And I, come on now, America, does that sound fair? Um, there's things where uh, someone stole a candy bar, supposedly, but there wasn't no evidence, yet that person got struck out. Simple things. So I think we should take a second look at our three strike laws and what counts for these three strikes. Um, I'm 50-50, um, you know, we, we do want to regulate as many people that come over here. If it helps kind of like the population and like the kids being uh, kidnapped and brought over here through, through those borders, if it helps to stop that, then I guess it's a good thing. Oh yeah, Trump, Trump dead on. Cause I mean, if he don't put the border up, come on, bro. Like the money, man. You gotta think, bro. Like, bro, you gotta think about it when, it, when it, I ain't against Migo. You feel what I'm saying? Cause I'm all the way Migo with my people, Migo. You know what I'm talking about? Victor Cavino, the Black Migo. That's me. You know what I'm talking about? I'm connected all the way over through. I don't want to talk to you, talk about this shit. But I'm trying to tell you, if he don't put it up, he ain't fighting. Cause Trump trying to get some of that yeah money, and yeah, they saying we ain't giving you no more of that money. He said, all right, well, we're going to build a wall. Build a wall, it's better for us. I ain't going to get into it. Do your research. It's better for us, but it ain't going to stop shit. Because when you got Amigo want to do something, by any means necessary, they going to do it. Underground, on top of the ground, over the wall, it don't matter. So, yeah, the wall helps us out. What are his views? I mean, all I, all I remember really is he wanted a wall, whatever that means. Um, Trump, to me, has been, um, he's, he's basically lift up the carpet. All the, the shit that's been swept under, everybody thinking like, oh, you know, America's this great place. Like, he showed exactly what America is. And, you know, there's so many people that think like him. It's a certain level of how you should carry yourself and say things, especially when you're a world-class leader. I understand the reason reasoning behind it. Trump is just saying whatever is convenient to him in the moment. Babies, kids don't come here alone, that they come here with their parents, um, or most of them at least, and that they've been separated. And now there are more than 500 kids that um, are without their parents and we're unable to locate them. Again, that is something that really makes me feel embarrassed to be an American. I don't, I don't care. And see, the funny thing about it is I drive trucks, so I drive down to 10. There's already, like, there's a big gate, there's a wall, you know, there, it's already there. So that's what I'm saying. He's talking about he wants to build it. It's been built. 
So um, there's parts where there isn't a wall, but there's parts where the wall, everybody wants the wall on both sides. The people in Mexico, they want the wall to be there. You know what I'm saying? The people in America, they want it to be there. Now what Trump's talking about, I, you know, I can't take anything that he says or any of the laws or anything that he does to be factual because I feel like he just says stuff just to say stuff. I don't think he puts any context in anything that he says. That's how I feel about what Trump says. I feel like he's just talking, just to have a camera there and to be, you know, cause a controversy. Trump's one of those people, if you, whether it's good press or bad press, it's a good press. I think his view of the wall is almost laughable. <laughs> his approach to deterring um, immigration is not helpful. How do you feel about Trump's views and policies on the Mexican border? No, <laughs> just kidding. You raise it up right. <laughs> no, you know, um, Trump is a complicated man. I don't think I have much respect for uh, any of his views. But when it comes to the Mexican borders, my view is how, how dare you? You know, um, I know that Trump is a very rich man and I know that he has used a lot of Mexican help to help build some of the things that he has. So how dare you build a border now that you're the president to keep those same people that helped you get where you're at out. How dare you want to use those same people to build that same wall. Um, I think it's irrational. I think it's obscene. And I think that um, all people have the right to, to this country. Um, they should have a fair shot. It's only fair. I think Trump's sad man. Look, don't let me get on on Trump. I can go forever. <laughs> yeah, we, we can all go on. Yeah, we can all go on. <laughs> the border policies, I mean, that, you know, again, there's arguments for both sides of any of these arguments, and I'm willing to hear all sides and come to the ultimate conclusion really is what it's all about. So that's my answer to really any of these questions or any question of all humankind. You know, I want to hear all sides of the argument and gather as much information as possible to come up with the best answer. Can we have no borders? Should we eliminate borders? Or are borders effective? And are they being carried out properly? I mean, it's such a dangerous question. Um, you know, I'm looking, for, I'm looking towards a better future where this question would be under a completely different context. Let's just say that. I'm looking forward to a better society, a better understanding across the quote unquote nation, which of course nations don't truly exist. There's stuff, you know, it's a name that we made up. Borders are invisible. We, we create them. So these things that are not eternally true, anything that's not eternally true will eventually come to fruition or come to manifestation and the fact that it's not a universal truth. So borders aren't universal, universally true. You know, this nations aren't, you know, these are, these are concepts which we've created and we enact laws and we write down things on paper which are not part of natural law, universal law. So I believe in getting back to root principles and first principles and universal law, natural law, and, and you know, treating thy neighbor how that would want to be treated and, you know, karma and things like this. So. I look forward to a much better future to where a question like this would be a completely different question. Trump or Biden in the 2020 election? Or perhaps another option? Why? I'm supporting Kanye West. Yeah. I don't want to vote for no other monkey. <laughs> Oops. I don't go as. I'm a future billionaire. So, I'm supporting who I'm supposed to support. Who supports me and my financial situation. So I'm gonna look in your face and I'm gonna tell you Trump 220. All the fucking way. Biden don't have enough sense and enough finances in his bank account to be a leader of any kind of nation that I'm gonna be a part of. So, yes, 
I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. Gemini's all the way. Mike Pence, Trump. Mm, I don't believe in politics. So I, I don't support either. And as far as rallying us up, we've been told we're the minority when we're actually the masses. So putting somebody like Kamala Harris with Biden is again, just using us. Um, I don't know what the difference is gonna be or if there will be any huge difference. Um, for somebody whose father was in prison my whole life, when you talk about Kamala and Biden and some of the things they've done in the past and bills they've passed to where there's mass incarceration, they all look like Trump, if you ask me. I mean, Democratic, Republican, their kids all go to the same private schools behind closed doors they're at, they're eating dinner country clubs all of that kind of stuff so to me it's all again divide and conquer make us pick a side when really we don't recognize our own power as the people would you rather someone walk up to you and say hey i'm gonna slap you and slap you or would you rather someone come from behind and just slap you Next. Yeah, I'm supporting Biden, but I have to say that um, I'm really nervous that if Biden wins, then all of the people that Trump inspired um, to get into politics are going to like hit the snooze button and then not be as fired up as they were, because obviously Trump got a lot of people into politics that weren't into politics before. I don't know. I mean, I also wonder that if we have Biden in for the next four or eight years, then someone more ridiculous than Trump is going to come in in 2028. So I, I am like perplexed over this election, but I'm going to vote for Biden kind of like because I feel like I just have to. I'm not supporting Trump and I'm not supporting Biden. I think I'll probably be I think Kanye West is going for president as well. So I think I'm going to be supporting him. I think he'll he, he'll do either the same or, or either, I don't think he could do any worse than Trump. So, <laughs> you know, it's going to be just another merry-go-round. You know, it seems like that's what we're going through nowadays. We're going through a, you know, a merry-go-round, a circus. So, hey, let's put somebody else on stage. I wouldn't support Trump in anything. I, I couldn't even, if I saw Trump about to get hit by a Mack truck, I'd probably turn around and walk the other way. I. I don't support him in nothing he says or does. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm not supporting Trump or Biden in the 2020 election. As I said in the previous question, I'm looking forward to a better future and you know, I'm looking for a better leadership is ultimately what, what I believe we need. Um, and a lot of people, when I, when I say leadership, they get scared and they think that I'm talking about oppressor, which I'm not talking about oppressor or even quote unquote authority. Authority, I'm talking about a uh, theoretical leader. I'm talking about someone that leads with the mind and leads with their actions and doesn't necessarily have to force anybody to do anything and leads by their actions and and leads by information so i'm trying to help elevate the conversation and lead by example and lead with information because we're in an informational war and i want us to win the war we the people all of us as one come up stronger and better and clearly that the way we've been doing things it's dying, it's going to die, you know. Uh, it's all systems that have been tried and, have been and they may have carried us, carried a purpose and brought us to, uh, you know, where we are and here we are in the, the 21st century and we have iPhones and satellites and rocket ships and this and that and, you know, we've come so far, but if we don't figure out something soon, uh, we're going to explode or rather implode. And, you know, I think it's, uh, I'm definitely not giving into this um, oppressive system of illusionary authority by any means. So that's what we're doing with the evolution of revolution. And we're trying to, um, that's what I'm doing with my next book that I'm writing right now, The Last Chance for Humanity, where we're coming up with real ways that we can avoid uh, tyrants and derelicts and uh, charlatans um, like our current politicians and current quote-unquote leaders and authority because almost all of them are corrupt in a way that's deplorable and it's going to bring us to our ultimate demise if we don't change our ways soon 
and I don't, I don't mean to give them all the responsibility. When I say change our ways, I mean all of us. We all need to change and we all need to stop accepting this bullshit or it's going to continue. It's going to continue. So no, I don't support that. state of the economy currently and how has 2020 affected you personally? Actually it hasn't affected me that much. I've been working more now and um, just being my own boss and not working for no one else. It's just made me step up my game more and and know that I, I, you can't depend on nobody and you have to work for yourself and go out and achieve your goals and your dreams. 2020 has just shown um, just how much of a capitalistic state America is in. Um, everything is about the dollar. They don't really care. If COVID is so dangerous. The fact that I still have to go to work <laughs> and be in contact. My company is not a necessity. I'm not an essential worker. The rich get rich and the poor get poorer. I kind of, I kind of feel like Biden's going to win and then Trump's going to say the election was rigged. Um, but in reality, Trump doesn't really want to win deep down, or not really deep down, just like, you know, um, behind closed doors, because there's clearly going to be a recession and he wants to blame Biden for it. Um, so that's kind of what always happens, right? Like the incoming president has to deal with the mess that was made prior and everything ebbs and flows. So, um, you know, so does the economy. But, um, but, you know, and unfortunately, I think the economy has been the biggest driver for so many Republican votes. Some Republicans that I really actually do respect, but they just have to make certain decisions because they have a lot of money and care about keeping their money. When the economy's in a downturn for, for the hustler, the, the, you know, there can't be a downturn in the economy. You're going to take anything that's going on and you're going to basically uh, capitalize off of it. This is capitalism, so um, I use that to my advantage when it comes down to the economy. I don't know, I feel like it's really testing people. It's testing the business owners to see how much hustle they have in them. You know, are you going to fight to keep your business open? Are you going to figure out how to keep it open? And I feel that the economy is going to make room for a lot of new rich people. I think a lot of people that had a good thing going uh, before COVID and they couldn't maintain it. Uh, by that being changed, we have opportunities for a lot of new people to invest in their ideas and spend their time investing and creating um, their own things. And this is gonna make, definitely making a lot more entrepreneurs. We haven't really felt the impact of um, the downward spiral of the economy and the COVID, but we do know a lot of people that, that have. Okay, the state of the economy is becoming extremely rocky. You know, again, the rich are becoming richer, the poor are becoming poor, uh, just like over time. And that's where, you know, a lot of these things start to look like agendas when certain people benefit and the poor just keep getting more poor and more oppressed. And, you know, um, freedoms that have sparked up are just as quickly dying. So, oh boy, the economy, I think it's, it's in trouble, you know, we, we hit a big one with shutting down of all the businesses, um, with COVID-19, and then after that we had riots flood through America and other countries, and you know, we hear sirens around, you know, it's Los Angeles and stuff's going on all the time, so um, I think the way that we conduct commerce and our economy currently is just, a, like I said in the last question, it's a system that, you know, it's it's brought us certain fruit, and I think uh, those fruits are getting rotten, and I think uh, the ship, ship will sink, and you know, we'll look for better, better ideas, better thinking, better days.
I think censorship is getting out of control. Um, we need freedom of speech. Um, we need to let the people know the truth. So I'm with freedom of speech, no censorship. Censorship is getting out of control. I feel like if you can say it, say it. I mean, excuse yourself if you made a mistake, but you, you wanted to say it, say it. Don't go to the grave, like, stop, like, they're already putting a muzzle on our mouth, and you're gonna go inside our soul, into our head and control that too. Are we in jail or what? No, this is the land of the free, the home of the brave. We're supposed to have the right to a freedom of speech. Let us talk. When we're talking about children, it should, there should be some shit that should be censored. Right now, um, you know, kids are exposed to so much more now that it's not fair to me. But I mean, as far as adults, yeah, you should be able to say what you need to say and but be respectful. Free speech is free speech. If you're gonna have it, let's have it. If we're not, let's censor. Let's censor it. And then let's all put on the same clothing and let's all eat the same slop and let's all believe the same, have the same beliefs. Oh yeah, they have a name for that. It's called communism. I think that um, we either have free speech or we don't. And we're in a gray area right now that makes it feel like at times we're living in 1984, in George Orwell's 1984, and at times it actually does feel like we're in a free country. I think that's a systemic issue too. That's deeply wound up in the purpose of capitalism. Again, I think we need some really, some like culture engineers to undo this Gordian knot somehow, but uh, everything is systemic. Censorship is definitely getting out of control because when it's free speech censorship, they don't go hand in hand. If we are a country of free speech, then everybody should be able to say whatever they want to say, you know? Uh, there's consequences for everything. But there shouldn't be a censorship. People should be able to say what they want to say. And then they could back it and say, oh, I didn't mean that later on, I guess. But you should be able to say what you want to say. No censorship. I've always been taught that a closed mouth don't get fed. So if you don't speak up, you don't get results. So you need to speak up, don't be silent, and say what you have to say, regardless if you think it's gonna be a retaliation. I know we try to keep ourselves in one lane, but you have to speak out. I think it depends on who you are. I think that when you're held at a certain stature, um, such as the presidency, you might wanna kind of edit some of your free speech. But when you're someone like me, I think free speech is it's essential. You should be allowed to say certain things. What possibly could it harm? <laughs> Free speech, I'm huge on free speech uh, when it doesn't come to defaming or, or robbing anybody of their rights and to where it doesn't come to a call to action or call to violence. I'm all for free speech and having a sophisticated adult conversation about any given subject um, when it doesn't take away from anybody else. So I'm huge on free speech, that's another big subject. Um, you can look into my work and get a, a much more broad answer, a much more um, in-depth answer from, but I'm a big free speech advocate. I think it's being threatened, uh, you know, now in a way that we haven't seen for decades. I think it's um, under attack. I think people are, you know, it's becoming filtrated to uh, the technocrats and um, the rulers of technology who will essentially be spoon feeding you what you need to say and what you need to believe as we've seen in so many laws in America recently in other countries um, they're going to be telling us what you have to believe if we don't uh, make a serious change very very fast because uh, people are being cut out of the conversation and that's your big old warning sign and red flag that tyranny is on its way. When, when people are being silenced and censored and saying, oh, we can't hear anything that this person has to say, or if anybody who says this or says anything against your, your rulers or your authority, they need to be silenced. That's when you know tyranny is underway and you are on a one-way ticket to systematic oppression and tyranny.
feel about Elon Musk, Neuralink, SpaceX, colonizing Mars, Tesla, AI, super AI, or humans being big microchips? How I feel about Elon Musk colonizing Mars and putting money on all these AI. Um, man, we have so much people starving on the streets and filth. Um, that money should be used for, for cleaning up our country instead of some galactic outer space things. That's how I feel about that. <laughs> hey, look, Elon Musk is a must. I love him. I love Elon Musk, and I'm with Elon Musk, and I, I, I own Tesla, you know? Uh, I love Elon Musk. Um, so, um, a chip? Yes, um, I feel like um, my kids need a chip. I want a chip. I keep telling my girl, put a chip in me. You need a chip. We all need chips. Yes, we need chips. You put a chip in your dog, don't you? Yes. Space? Yes. Research? Yes. Elon Musk? Yes, it's a must. It's a go. Green, go green. Go green. People should be able to choose. You know, if, 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 if people want to go to Mars and live on Mars, let them choose that. Uh, don't force anybody. Don't uh, force anybody to stay. Let everybody pick and choose what they want to do. I think that's what um, would be better for our society. If there, if there has to be a microchip inside somebody, I say it should be in pedophiles. All pedophiles should have a microchip. They should, we should know where they're at at all times. No, that's, that's inhumane to me, and that should not happen. We're not animals to where we need microchips or any type of thing like that to be put inside of us. I don't know. I, I really haven't given it too much thought about humans being microchipped. I remember at one point, um, humans didn't want to get vaccines, and now look at us. In order for kids to go to school, we're vaccinating them up. So maybe t 10 years from now, we'll understand the importance of it. Um, I think we're lacking a little bit of knowledge. I think it sounds scary because it's something new. So um, maybe with a little more information, I'll be comfortable with it. But as of right now, it's kind of still in the air. I don't know if I want to be microchipped yet. <laughs> hmm. That's another huge question, uh, which again, I uh, can't answer fully tonight. I would urge you to look in my work. Uh, Sick Logic is my pen name. My book is Alpha and Omega of the Soul, a Holistic Exploration of Consciousness. That's my book and I just did a series over 100 videos um, tackling subjects like this. Um, I'm gonna just make it very, very quick for the people at home today. Uh, technology is taking over. Technology is rapidly outpacing our um, our morale and our uh, sophistication of philosophy and psychology and more so our ethics and morals so as technology surpasses our our ethics and our morality and takes over and the people behind technology take over you know we're gonna see very very dark days coming uh, ahead very very soon if we don't find a way to bring what's in the dark into the light and make global conversations like this 10,000 voices where everyone's invited to the table and it's not just these private think tanks that's one of my big things that I'm talking about in my book is public think tanks and how we're all a part of the conversation we're all a piece of the puzzle so we can all see the big picture and this the technology it's taking off I mean literally they want to colonize Mars and put chips in your brain and start pushing buttons and you know and and becoming merging with AI so this is a huge huge subject and I will do a lot of work on this in the future I can promise you that um, so I can just say look uh, go SIC LOGIC sick logic on the uh, on your search engine DuckDuckGo etc and find out more about the material and my opinions about this because we can't really get into full depth on that right now Is there anything else you would like to add to this discussion? Everybody has to do their research and know where they stand. Don't just believe the news or the media. Do your own damn research. At the end of the day, God is love and that, you know, as people, we do need to embrace being different, learn from each other, you know, um, and be willing to have the conversations with one another. Um, they say we're like 
integrated, but if you think about it, we are. There is still a certain degree of segregation. Everybody sticks to what they know um, and fear or judge those they don't. No, I think I said enough, a lot, actually. No, this has been so fun. Thank you so much for asking these questions. They're really good questions. Today has been very interesting for me. The questioning, um, I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate uh, letting my voice be heard. Um, I would like to thank Gary Graves for you know, giving me, my family, um, an outlet to come out and to speak. I hope he does great in whatever it is he does. He's an awesome dude. I hope that this reaches the 10,000 voices, 10,000 households, 10,000 people. And um, I hope that this video helps make a change, a change that is much needed. Yes, uh, thank you for being a part of the 10,000 Voices documentary. I hope you check out the video. I hope you love it and enjoy it. And know that I have a lot of great music and material coming for you. And a lot of great uh, video, documentary material and vlog material coming for you. Which, you know, I, I talk probably longer than other people on these. But these, I just, you know, I'm over here. Like I've been, I'm on four hours of sleep. Work to the bone, haven't eaten really thing, anything more than a salad in the last week. You know, you can learn about the master cleanse and how I did that in my, in my book breakdown series. I want to thank you for being a part of this and for watching, uh, watching it to the end and with the mindful eye and from learning and being a part of the conversation. So this has been really dope. It's been a time unlike any other and I really enjoyed it and much love. At the end of the day, it all comes down to love and the oneness. So I have mad love for everyone and hopefully um, that can be interpreted in the way that it makes sense most to you.